Hello and welcome to the second edition in our new series of virtual online discussions here at CNBC Africa called Business Tomorrow. I'm Chris Bishop. Now this is the show that looks at how we can revitalize business beyond the difficult days of COVID-19. We'll be on air, online and on point. As usual, we'll be going out live to 16 million households of 48 countries in Africa, but also on this program, we're on Zoom to a select audience from whom we'll take questions at the end of the show. This will be a lively and challenging discussion, so hold on to your hats. This week, we tackle the once mighty tourism industry of South Africa that used to create nearly 3% and support more than four, sorry, 700,000 jobs and that's more than mining. So let's have a quick look at the, the numbers of the industry, uh, just to see how it all stacks up. As you see there, um, this is how business is faring under COVID-19. Say 34% of firms say revenues down by 100% from a year ago. 58% say they were unable to service their debt. 54% unable to cover fixed costs in March 2020. And half, 50% of firms have reduced wages for more than 50% of their staff. So now, in many ways, South African tourism is a world-class asset, but recently it's been struggling, even before COVID-19. Let's have a quick look behind the industry. South Africa has the beaches, it has the mountains, it has the big five roaming, world-famous game parks. Even in the bad times, the South African tourism industry was coming up with the goods. In 2018, Stats SA estimated that one in every 22 working South Africans were employed in the tourism industry. In one year alone, the industry created 30,000 jobs. Yet lingering red tape around visas for visitors put a lot of tourists off. Safety and security have also been a dampener on the industry. Now COVID-19 has dealt tourism, along with a lot of other industries in Africa, a body blow. So where now? How will tourism get back on its feet? About 1.5 million jobs are at stake and nearly 3% of GDP. How is South Africa going to get the world back on its beaches, in its game parks and on the peaks of its mountains? And how much have people suffered on the ground in these difficult days of COVID-19? Well, earlier I spoke to Mpumi Ntinso, a bicycle entrepreneur who works out of the famous Vilakazi Street in Soweto. That's the street where Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu used to live. I'll say, I'll say we were fairly still a, a small entity. Um, but, I mean, we would do on a good month um, up to probably 50 tours um, in and around Soweto. Um, my tours are nine kilometers, really. Um, they take about four hours to do. And, and yeah, so that's the scale of it. And then with, with regards to what I'm doing now, <laughs> um, so I've, 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 I've moved from bicycle tours to bicycle deliveries, uh, like a bicycle career company. Um, so I do, I use the same bicycles that I use for my bicycle tours to deliver packages and essential goods in and around Soweto. Um, and I will go as far as Randbeck because we are cyclists. So um, a distance is never a problem for us, especially on a bicycle. What are your hopes and fears for the tourism industry after this? Uh, well, hopefully whenever the COVID-19 epidemic pandemic passes. Well, to be quite honest, I just I just wish that there can be more um, information available, especially for township entrepreneurs. You'd be surprised to, to find out how many people don't know that there's actually um, a, a forum like the South African Tourism Organization. You know, so I just I just wish that after the whole COVID-19, uh, such information can be easily accessible for township entrepreneurs, you know, because that information at the end of the day is what makes a business thrive. You know, um, not everyone is able to join uh, Airbnb or TripAdvisor. So as, as, part of, as part of my job, if I may call it that, I assisted other township entrepreneurs to get on those platforms to be able to uh, attract tourists to their Soweto bicycle experiences or walking experiences, you know? So I just wish after this COVID, um, that kind of information, can it be easily accessible by, you know, um, township entrepreneurs more especially. Well, that was Mpumin Tinso there. He's a bicycle entrepreneur down in Soweto. And uh, we'll hopefully have a question from him, from our panel, as soon as we go. But uh, let's start uh, introducing the people we're going to be speaking to. 
on this. We'll be going from the corridors of power to the Kruger Park. The CEO of South African Tourism. He'll be uh, on the line. We've also got Don Scott, the owner of Tanda Tula in the Timbavati up near the Kruger Park, and David Frost, the CEO of Satsa, and Chifiwa Chivengwa, the CEO of Tourism Business Council of South Africa. So let's start. Um, let's start with, uh, firstly, actually, just before um, we uh, get into it too much, um, the uh, bicycle entrepreneur of Soweto, he asked if we could put a quick question um, to maybe um, a gentleman from SA Tourism. Uh, if we could just have a look exactly at what he says, and then uh, we shall we come back to you, Mr. Nchona, for your response. This is a personal question, uh, but it will be why do they use the same people when they advertise tourism in Soweto? Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, they always use uh, Saki's restaurant and Leo's backpackers. So my question is, with so many people that are doing tourism in Soweto, why are those two always, always the chosen ones? There you are, Mr. Cesar Nchona, of CEO of Southern African Tourism. Uh, also, our man there in Soweto was saying that um, he thought that there wasn't enough information getting down to small sort of entrepreneurs like himself. What's your response to that? Yeah, thank you very much, Antony, for the opportunity. Um, certainly, tourism has come under pressure, not only in South Africa, but globally as well. And, uh, you know, we're all trying to find our way and navigate our way around this. And it's a very difficult balance of trying to balance uh, lives versus livelihoods. Uh, to get to the question around how we profile in South Africa, and sometimes you see some of the recurring faces and themes again, you know, we tend to lead with what, what is known, but at the back end of that, trying to peel the onion, as it were, and try to reveal different layers as we go down there. Uh, but I simply take to heart the recommendation that is making, and uh, I remain open and available for any new activities, new activities to be shown as well, you know, so, uh, yeah, I'm available. Okay, well, um, there's uh, the answer there, but we're moving a bit wider now to the damage that COVID-19 has done to the tourism industry. And if I could move to you, uh, Mr. Chifiwa Chivengwa, um, the CEO of the Tourism Business Council, just give us an idea exactly of how much it's hurt the tourism industry. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> the damage that uh, the COVID-19 has uh, done to tourism globally uh, is, is devastating. Uh, and uh, you can see this, you know, from many various countries that are showing that, uh, you know, a lot of people are not at work or they've been uh, sent home temporarily. And it's the same here in South Africa. The damage is here. We have seen it since the beginning of the year uh, when uh, the disease uh, or the virus came into South Africa and it started to spread within the uh, communities. We started to see cancellations coming through. We had to process a lot of refunds and, and, and things like that. So the damage is devastating. We are expecting um, around 160,000 people, uh, meaning employees, to be affected by this damage in the short term. So far, uh, with uh, the application of the UIF, which is the uh, Unemployment Insurance Fund, uh, I have seen uh, 50,000 employees uh, just over 50,000 that have applied for this uh, relief. And we are certainly expecting that this number will double and triple in the next month. And uh, if we continue on the level that we're in without any economic activity, we're expecting that we should see at least uh, 1 million to 1.1 1, uh, 1 .1 million people without jobs. So it has been de devastating. Lots of companies cannot pay rent. Uh, they cannot pay salaries. Uh, they cannot sustain their livelihoods. Some of them have higher purchases in terms of the vehicles and the properties that they have bought. So it has devastated you know, our industry in a way that we've never seen before. And it, it has really yeah. touched uh, in many homes in South Africa. And uh, you know, yeah. if we don't have any activities going, we're expecting this to be worse in the next coming few months. Uh, and certainly it's not a good picture for the industry. Uh, and it's not something that we would want to see. So it, it is a devastation from employment, from income, and from all aspects, you know, that sustain our livelihoods as a tourism industry. A lot of people are sitting at home without sure. knowing where they're going to get their next meal. Sure. Well, going um, to find out exactly how much, we're going right down now to the uh, 
to the grassroots of the industry and Don Scott. Now, you've got a game lodge in the Timbabati, which is up near the Kruger National Park in northern South Africa. Now, aside from the economic pain, you've also got the problem in the fact that there's no one on your game lodge at the moment, hardly, and the animals are starting to invade again, and also some of the bush is starting to grow back. Just give us an idea of how much damage there's been and how you're coping with it. Don. Apologies. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I thought somebody else was going to unmute. No, but, uh, <laughs> it's you. Doing it manually nowadays. Um, thank you for that. Yes. Uh, just to start off with the, um, you know, for us, we, lockdown started actually on the 15th of March uh, when the first travel bans to South Africa and borders were closed. Uh, for everyone else, it only started two weeks later. So we've, we've been in this for a little while longer. Uh, anybody who is in the tourism sector who is... Um, accepting international guests in their facilities. Uh, they started this process earlier than everyone else. We also saw a ramp down starting in February. So we were kind of aware of what was coming and everyone was starting to make adjustments to that. But I don't think anybody quite had in their minds what was about to happen to them. Uh, so in the reserves themselves, you know, we we based ourselves back inside the reserve at our camp. Everything emptied out. Um, it's quite a ghostly and eerie experience to be there without the hustle and bustle of all the guests. And you're right, we have literally been uh, not only cutting back uh, the bush, because as I said to you last week on that telephone call, I think that if we were to uh, leave our camp for more than a month, we wouldn't find it again. Uh, <laughs> the wildlife tends to move in um, as soon as there's less uh, human activity. Uh, the bush uh, happily grows in over the roads if there's not cars driving down those roads. and um, Funny enough, the, the wildlife carries on with their lives, so uh, ir oblivious of, of, of the traumas that are going on for us as humans. Um, and in addition to that, uh, those natural processes, things like fires, those carry on as well. We've had to deal with that in the, two, in, in, in the weeks that we've been locked down in the reserve. We've had to deal with uh, bushfires. Um, and we've had to deal with the uh, continued security efforts within the reserve as well. All of these are things that you cannot just stop doing uh, simply because the tourists have stopped coming. So uh, we are faced with the need to continue with these activities, even though we are faced with a situation where we have zero income. Okay, and if I move to David Frost now, the CEO of Satsa, um, I know that uh, the industry is putting its evidence together to give to uh, government to try to find a way out of this COVID-19, but can you give us some idea of the sort of economic, the, the financial damage that has been suffered in the industry? Uh, sure, I think just a, an introductory remark, and I think that you've just got to bear in mind that this process is, is unraveling incredibly quickly. So that data that we um, were able to garner through a survey done through the IFC in partnership with the National Department and the Tourism Business Council that you put up in your introduction, that, that really covered March and a bit of April. What we are seeing going forward is 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 a is a far more dire um, picture, and I think that at the same time the protocols and the response um, to the country has you know was, has, has also only only come into play um, towards the end of March and going through to April, and and that will unfold as we go forward. I think what we are doing now is we are putting a structured process together in which the tourism industry can put a collective and a data-driven voice in partnership with our government partners to government about how we can, how we can manage a recovery in the sector going forward. Um, so from, a, from a, 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 a financial point of view, I think the picture that you painted in the beginning is going to get even more dire if we, if we have to wait until next year to open, open the sector up. Just in terms of the um, impact that tourism plays in the economy, you have a direct tourism economy and then an indirect impact that tourism plays. It, it creates jobs in food, in banking, in transport, in, in a myriad of sectors. And the indirect employment contribution is 1.5 million jobs. If those jobs go, it's, it's going to have a dire effect. And it's not just the jobs. For every, for every job in an urban area, 
four to five people are supported. But in a rural area, and Don will attest to that in his part of the world, the people he employs are supporting between 12 to 15 people. And just take a conservative national average as one job sustains six people. That means the tourism is putting food on the table of every seventh South African. When this industry goes, the food goes. So I think we've got to look at innovative solutions. And I, and, and I think we've got to work together in that process. So, um, uh, Don, before we come back to you, I'd just try, like to try Susan Chorner again from SA Tourism. I mean, one of the big questions, and I want to speak to Mr. Chibengo about this as well, is that uh, is the economy opening fast enough for the survival of, of the tourism industry? I think the answer of that lies in terms of how South Africa has handled the pandemic. Uh, are we handling the pandemic as efficient as possible? We are currently at risk level four as a country, and uh, the next couple of weeks will determine whether we actually come down the ratings or actually regress back up again. Uh, the tight balance here is between opening the economy whilst making sure that livelihoods and lives are actually uh, restored. And globally as well, we've seen that 95% of airlines have stopped operating essentially. So that puts a big fix in terms of how the world is connected uh, going forward. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Mchona. We're still struggling a bit with your audio there, but if I go to you, Chipiwa Chibengwa, um, if I go to you now, um, what about the travel restrictions as well? I mean, that, I, we were talking this morning on the show saying that we can't see them disappearing anytime soon. Surely that's going to play even more havoc with the tourism industry. No, absolutely. Uh, the travel restriction, be it even domestic, where we deal with uh, issues around interprovincial travel, it is an issue uh, because people are unable to move around. Of course, we do support the, the, the efforts that the government is making in terms of mitigating the spread of, uh, of this virus. Uh, but from the tourism you know, point of view, in terms of uh, the sustainability of the industry, we need to see from the domestic point of view, at least interprovincial travel, uh, and also air travel so that people can then get up and down uh, uh, to different areas. We now have people that are called essential services that needs to travel to Cape Town, to uh, Richards Bay and many other parts of the country. We want to be able to, to put those people in a plane uh, in, in a controlled way with protocols and they should be able to get to those destinations. So uh, same as international, we need to really look into that to say what are the things that we can put in place uh, from the mitigation point of view and which country can we start looking at, uh, especially the countries that have low spread of the, of the virus, can we at least look into those countries to say, can we start opening our borders you know, for those countries? But those are the debates and the discussions that we're having with, uh, with government. But surely we need to ensure that you know, there is a movement of people locally so that we can support uh, essential uh, services and also people can move around to support our industry if you look at the restaurants uh you know it, the situation there as much as uh, you are able to go and uh, you're able to order and get someone to deliver it may not be as sustainable that's why we still see many restaurants that are not opening same as hotels and b and b's and guest houses uh you know they are unable you know to survive sufficiently if there's no movement uh, of people so the movement of people is key uh, in, in, in tourism. And that is why we put together protocols uh, as an industry to say, let us operate provided we follow these guidelines that we've put together to de-risk the industry. Uh, and once we put those in place, we'll make sure that in, even the SMMEs uh, that are unable to uh, potentially have the resources to deal with, you know, mm. applying this, uh, these guidelines, so we can sure. figure out a way of ensuring that you know we assist the SMMEs, but sure. it's quite important that people move. It's quite important that we start looking at opening our borders, uh, sure. but in a very calculated way and to various destinations that have low risk of transmission uh, for the virus, that we can sure. have some economic activities, sure. uh, tourism-wise. Now, if I go back to Don Scott uh, at a game lodge in the Timbabati in northern uh, South Africa. If um, you've heard Mr. Chivengwa talking there, saying that uh, the industry supports um, controlled movement of people, making precautions, but are you not afraid uh, that some of your customers that you may have had for years might just look at it and say, well, actually, it's a lot of hassle. Actually, it's going to cost a lot more 
to go to uh, see animals in the bush again, I'm not going to do it. Yes, of course, that, that is a massive concern for all of us. And I think that um, that's where a lot of the discussions that we've been having internally as an industry um, have centered around how do we mitigate the circumstances in a way that will make it attractive for people to, to continue to come to us and to continue to uh, want to be in our, in, in our spaces. Um, you know, as a, we're in an industry subsector, that's the um, wildlife and safari tourism subsector, which actually is, a, in a way, it's a, it's a um, social distanced uh, sec subsector of the industry itself. We're far away from everything. We have great open spaces and open air. Uh, we have, we're, we're very boutique in terms of uh, the uh, sizes of the, of, of the lodges that operate in these areas. So people are naturally not in a massive crowd space. So all of those things are things that we want to talk to, um, to the uh, community of, of international travelers who we would like to have um, return to our lodges. But uh, if, if I may, just going back to what Chief was saying there is, um, you know, in order to get that to happen, a few things have to happen and they have to happen a lot more urgently than what they're happening at the moment. The one thing is we need to get uh, the allowance to open our doors again. And I cannot stress this enough. You know, if people are talking about the damage to the industry and um, we're not talking about damage here. We're actually talking about a fundamental and unrecoverable collapse unless we allow the tourism industry to open its doors again. Now, obviously, there is an element of that that would be domestic travel. My uh, own business does not rely on domestic travel very much. We're a business that is very much the, 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 the export market. So we're bringing in um, uh, you know, foreign, foreign currency into the country. Um, and I believe that it is very important to get the domestic uh, tourism sector going, but I don't believe that the domestic tur tourism sector can support the tourism industry on its own. We have to have the foreign tourists back. I think David might be able to give us better information as to yeah. what is the split sure. between foreign spend versus local yeah. spend in a, in, a, in a typical year, but we have to get that open. Um, and then the last thing is, you know, talking to that, you know, everyone talks about post COVID. I don't believe there's a post COVID, there's a pre COVID mm -hmm. and then there's a with COVID. And we need to actually now work to mitigate the way that we work in such a way that we can actually open our operations with the, uh, with the presence of this virus amongst us and to act in a way with these protocols that gives us the opportunity to do that. So, sure. you know, as, as an industry, we're, we're quite a well sanitized industry already. You know, we cater for the fact that people are living in each other's spaces and there's one guest leaving and another guest mm -hmm. coming in. We're sure. always you know, very careful with our uh, sanitation and to add these protocols would be really easy for us. So uh, yeah. I think the, me, the big thing is we're, there's not enough urgency and Chief and CISA and David, your, your bodies are doing fantastic work. We really, really appreciate it. And I think what we need to do now is really start lobbying aggressively with government because sure. we are just not moving fast enough. Okay. Well, sure. We're going to talk about regulation as well in a second. But David, I'm going to put it to you. Uh, I think he, um, Don's got a point there in the fact that without the hard currency of the rest of the world, the industry is going to struggle here. Surely it would be worth the private industry and government throwing every single cent it's got into advertising, into getting people over here to, uh, to you know, re revitalize the industry. Yeah, look, I, I think Don just put it incredibly uh, eloquently and quite succinctly in terms of um, what, what is needed. So there, definitely we need greater urgency. And as he said, it's, it's a world with COVID. I think it, just take a step back, pre-COVID, just, just, and just get your head around some of these numbers. There is massive inter-first world travel. You know, travel from the States into Europe is, is, is a huge volume. Spain and France get in, in, used to get in excess of 80 million tourists a year. And their tourism is predicated on three main things. It's culture, food, and antiquities. Generally, the, you, you are doing those indoors because the, the weather's not great for most of the year and but in, great, in, in great groups of people. That entire model of tourism is gone. And as Don said, what we offer in South Africa is great weather and wide open spaces. Wildlife has always been the major pull. And I think that there's certainly, if you just take a small percentage of diverted traffic and, and people with a propensity to travel, 
I think let's just reflect on, on the domestic thing. I think intuitively the recovery needs to needs to look there. But bear in mind, and, and as I said in my introduction, the next two months are going to get dire. Most companies in the country have been able to sort of manage things in in, in February, sorry, in March and April. So employees got it at the end of uh, March. It might have been scaled down in April. We're now into retrenchments and layoffs. And there is, you know, given, given the economics of, 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 of the situation in the country, we haven't seen a major fiscal stimulus package from government in any meaningful way. I think there have been attempts to the UIF tours and, and a number of other issues. But predominantly, the domestic economy has not been supported. People are not going to have disposable income for leisure tourism. They're going to be living hand to mouth. The, uh, corporate travel um, is going to change radically. We all used to get on planes and go and have meetings in Germany, in Cape Town, in Durban. It's all going to happen on Zoom now. We're still with Business Tomorrow, the idea of getting business back on the road after COVID-19. And we're looking at the massive industry, which employs more than 700,000 people, the world of tourism, which obviously has taken a huge hit. Now, still with me on the line is Don Scott. He's got a resort up in the Timbavati near the Kruger Park. We've also got uh, Shifiwa Chibengwa, the CEO of Tourism Business Council, and David Frost, the CEO of Satsa, and also Sizan Chorna from SA Tourism. So um, what is um, government uh, should, role should be in this? Uh, I'll go to you, um, Chibengwa, Mr. Chibengwa, because basically uh, you're the one who's putting forward now proposals to the government, how we get out of this. I'm going to ask Caesar in a second what he thinks. But uh, what do you think government's role should be? Should there be uh, regulatory changes? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I think that government's role uh, should be to enable the tourism industry to operate. Uh, as, as the first and foremost. But in this situation, we want government, you know, to, to partner with us, and we have been doing this uh, through the Minister of Tourism, to say that uh, as an industry, we are ready to operate, we are ready to put out, you know, protocols that we can follow and apply across the board, and we want government to support us. We're not necessarily looking for a regulation that will say operate in this way. Uh, and. The other thing that we're looking for from government is the support financial. If, if we're unable to open now, which is what we want, because we want to earn an income, we want to be able to support our employees, we want to be able to support our businesses and be sufficiently uh, you know, liquid you know, to make sure that you know, we protect the industry. If we can't operate now, we're going to need a huge or massive stimulus that's aimed at the tourism industry. Uh, we've done some scenarios that, through uh, you know, South African tourism to say you know, tourism could be opening in December. Uh, and we've said as a tourism business council that December is way too far and we cannot afford to open then because there, won't, there wouldn't be anything to open for because uh, the aviation industry will be impacted. We may not have any more airlines you know, in, in South Africa. Uh, we, we won't have any lodges left. We won't have any hotels and especially the SMMEs that will be hit hard. You know, we have made some gains uh, for the past 25, 26 years of developing a lot of, you know, uh, SMMEs uh, that are from townships and many different places. We need to make sure that we protect those SMMEs. Sure. And majority of those SMMEs are dependent on large businesses, sure. uh, you know, for, for windfall of, 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 of trips and tours that they sure. do to fulfill for, the, for big businesses. Okay. So for us, we want government to be able to, you know, help us protect the industry while we're doing this. Also for government to, you know, market the country, uh, we need to look at issues around e-visas, visa waivers for various countries when we reopen. It would be great that when we open, we're not just saying that we open and things are the same. Things should be different. Uh, we should have mm. ease of access uh, for a lot of airlines that want to come to South Africa. Okay. We should have a, a new uh, 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 immigration regime. Uh, which is technological base, and we need to solve other things that we have on the ground that are impacting our industry. So sure. if at this time, while you know we are fighting for opening, we need to solve mm. those things. Sure. But the most important thing that we want is that we need to open, we need to operate, 
we need to service you know the clients that we have we need to have an indication of when we're going to start opening for international markets we prefer to work and make income sure. instead of receiving okay. a stimulus package. well let me put that um that question straight to caesar and chona from sa tourism which is as you know a government uh, body Bearing in mind the government's got a diminishing pool of public funds, you're bailing out industries uh, left, right and centre in South Africa, even now in the heat of this COVID-19. Can you afford, can the government afford of South Africa, can afford to bail out tourism? I think the world uh, essentially is in the same space there. Uh, the first one is that what we need is a measured response. Yes, the one that says we've got to get the economy going but not at the cost of lives. And that's the balance that we need to find. Certainly, what government has done is to come up with the risk-adjusted framework. It's a template that is there that everyone can look and see how they can actually operate it. At the back of it, it's encouraging, is that the sector now is getting together to saying, how do we work ourselves up uh, that, uh, that rating so that we can get back on stream as quickly as possible? What we also need to do is to Sorry, divide the sector okay. into sub-sectors, right? Because you cannot look at the sector holistically as an aggregate. You know, because one area of the business poses a very different risk from the other. And it is in how we actually allow this ease and back on that is uh, get quite important. If I could go back to uh, Don Scott now in the Timber Party. I, I was just thinking about, uh, after we spoke last week, about ways possibly out of this. Is it not in your interests as tour operators in the long term, maybe not in the short term, to offer you know, half-price holidays to try to get the world to come back to South Africa and its world-famous resorts? Yeah, Chris, I think that um, there's a knee-jerk response um, that suggests the way to attract visitors is the first thing that you've got to do is drop your prices. Um, I don't think that that is a long-term sustainable model for, for, for my business personally. I think that there are possibly other businesses that can do that. Um, we have the agility to change the way we price, and we certainly have the agility and the ability to uh, offer specials, and that's where the industry gets really creative. I mean, there's fantastic stuff that, that, that comes out at a time like this where people are proposing different packages and, and, and so on that, that, that could be offered as stimulus to people uh, visiting the, the various tourism operations from anything from you know uh, engaging with uh, business travelers to where we would have might have been more in a traditionally in a pure leisure market. It could be uh, things like uh, offering specific packages for family travel, that kind of thing. I, I don't think that the long term solution is to simply shave your revenue in half. You could certainly do that for a short period, but I don't think the solution is to do that in the long term. Sure. I mean, the short term was uh, what I was actually suggesting. But if I go back to Mr. Chubeng, we're, we're starting to get questions coming in from people who are uh, online. And uh, one thing they've said, which might be interesting uh, for you to answer in an industry point of view, they say in China, every cell phone receives updates from the government on a regular basis. Can, is this possible here in South Africa? And could it help uh, people in the tourism industry? Well, I, I think it's possible, and I think it's something that government have uh, uh, spoken about when they talk about uh, uh, test and trace, uh, to trace those that may have been in contact with, uh, uh, you know, someone who has uh, COVID-19. So there is a possibility, but this is something that, you know, the department, the responsible department uh, needs to put in place. And of course, you need consent from citizens, uh, because then you, you harvesting information that is uh, personal and private. Uh, but it's something that can be looked at and it's something uh, that could be implemented, you know, uh, if uh, uh, the citizens of the country agrees. Uh, certainly, uh, if other countries have done it and if, they, if they've done it successfully and if we can implement such things in our industry uh, with the consent of, uh, of, of, of the tourists, uh, you know, those kinds of things could be done. But we need to be mindful of uh, uh, the privacy of tourists uh, and, and uh we need to make sure that we get consent from them. So I think there is a possibility of using technology in many different ways uh, to ensure that we, we mitigate the risk uh, of the virus. And this is something that we're encouraging, for example, the likes of AXA at the airport. You know, how do we use technology to make sure that you know, people travel safely? How do you gauge the temperatures at the airport and, and so forth and so on? So there are many ways that we can use and adopt. But of course, all this will cost some money 
uh, and uh, it, it may make uh, the cost of traveling a little bit higher because, you know, as you implement new technology, you need to recover the money somewhere else. But there is a space for technology to be used. There's a space for cell phones to be used, uh, provided that we all agree that, you know, that's the route that we need to take. And there's an interesting question here from somebody uh, who's listening online. Um, and I'd like to hear from uh, Mr. David Frost about this one. Because you were mentioning earlier, oh, well, we can't get into planes anymore to go and attend meetings and do it all on Zoom. But someone's suggesting here that surely corporates uh, should start traveling more after this COVID thing is lifted to help economic recovery. Uh, what's, your, uh, what's your take on that one? Well, I think that, you know, that's going to be, you know, corporates will, I mean, as they always have done, will have travel travel protocols. I mean, some corporates before this crisis had protocols about, you know, executives not traveling on the same planes and everything. And they'll have to take a view on the risk um, on on the risk going forward. I think it's important to note, though, although we a lot of our discussion today has been on the inbound um, side of things and, you know, if we are, if we're going to open that up um, at some stage, which we are, which I think we are all advocating, um, and we're saying the sooner the better for the industry, we've equally got to be able to um, be able to stim- sort of s- stimulate outbound demand from South Africa because planes flying in here don't can't just rely on inbound traffic. We've got to have a sustainable outbound um, market. So that's combination of leisure and uh, and uh, business. So, you know, there may well be an argument to encourage that type of travel um, in order to make in order to make air travel um, viable. And I think it's going to be incredibly interesting. You know, there, 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 there are various components, and I think CISA uh, mentioned that. You know, firstly, which airlines have an appetite to travel? Secondly, what does the economics of, of air travel in a, in a COVID environment look like? Thirdly, what are the protocols that airlines can put in place to actually mitigate the risk of, of uh, people traveling with the virus? So, you know, we talk about, you know, pre-testing and, 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 and getting a COVID passport, et cetera. So all of those we've got to have a, you know, we've got to have a look at. But I, th- I think the collective voice you're hearing from us today, and we, we echo our members, is there's certainly an appetite to to do this there's an appetite to resuscitate tourism our job is is we've got to make this can do we can't just say no until june next year or february next year our our job is let's make it data driven let's let's get the industry's views together and then let's have a, a a sensible and a measured discussion with government and we totally acknowledge their role is 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 to balance um a whole lot of um you know sort of you know, absolutely awful things that they're trying to manage together. But I think that the the conversation is going to shift in in the days ahead to how do we open up and how do we open up in 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 a safe way. Okay, I got another question coming in from the audience, and it's for Don Scott out there on the ground in the Timbavati. Now the question is. Though many of us have business interruption insurance with specific mention of contagious diseases, but the insurers are not accepting liability and giving the industry, the tourism industry, the runaround. Is it not time the government put pressure on the insurance industry to cover more of the liabilities of their clients? 100%. Absolutely 100%. And uh, I would just like to talk about that a little bit because we too have business interruption insurance as a lot of our uh, colleagues uh, in, in, in the Kruger Lofeld, uh have business interruption insurance and very specifically the, the extension that covers you for um, identifiable diseases. And the, 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 the first thing that the insurers have done is, you know, the, certainly the big reinsurers uh, internationally have gone be, to hide behind the force majeure tree. And that for us is not uh, a, a valid argument and in fact we've engaged with um, uh, public claims assessors who have advised us that in fact all of us have got a very very uh, viable claim and in fact what is happening is that the insurance companies are simply worried that they don't have the kind of cash to cover all the claims that are coming their way 
Um, so, of course, that would probably then mean that there needs to be some kind of reasonable settlement between the insured and the insurers, because nobody wants the insurance industry to fail entirely. But the point is this, the, the insurance industry has a much deeper set of balance sheets than the tourism industry does. Tourism industry relies very heavily on our cash flow to operate. The insurance industry has got years and years of masses of cash reserves. So, you know, to deny us the cash on the basis that they're worried that they're going to have too many claims and might fail in the end, um, I feel is a, is, is, is a completely um, incorrect approach and is really, really letting people down who have uh, for years paid their premiums diligently. Uh, the other thing is, I, and I agree with you 100%, there should absolutely be intervention at government level to put pressure on the insurance companies to say, okay, you guys need to come to the party in this, in this situation. The, what, what the, what the uh, insurance industry represents is a very strong possibility for companies that would otherwise go under to have the liquidity to at least be on sufficient life support to survive this thing if we are forced into a prolonged and protracted period of, of, of closure. What they're also not telling you as insurance companies is that in the time that we've been in lockdown, they've ended up with a massive surplus due to the lack of claims and people continuing to pay their premiums. And I estimate that that's probably in the billions somewhere. So, you know, they are definitely not playing ball on this one. And I think that the government needs to come to our aid and put pressure on them. Absolutely, 100%. Okay. Now, if I go now to Mr. Chubengwe, just to build on what you were talking about, travel restrictions earlier, they're going to take time. Now, a question from the uh, audience is, at a time like this, there's small numbers of domestic travellers who will make up the numbers, maybe. Now, what the question person is asking is, who in the value chain can support the tourism industry? And again, like your previous question, they've mentioned highly profitable corporates like banks and insurance companies. Should they not be forced to unlock some of their cash surpluses uh, or at least uh, to try to avert some of the job losses in the industry? What do you say, Mr. Chibengwa? Um, I think, uh, you know, corporate travel, you know, on its own, it's, it's quite important in the country. Uh, and there will be, uh, from the corporate side of things, a lot of hesitation, as David have said, in terms of, you know, when do they want to travel, how do they preserve their own cash and so forth and so on. But from the financing point of view, if you look at the banks and, and, and everyone else who's sitting on cash, uh, you know, of course, we would want, you know, support from the banks and, and everybody else uh, who can support the sector. Uh, but the most important thing is that, you know, if, if you get the support and the industry is not going to come back, uh, you know, it's almost like throwing money, you know, down the drain, because if we don't open and have some money, and if we get support, it will be support just to take us to a, some point where there won't be any more support, and there won't be anything left. Uh, so, so that's another, you know, discussion and debate that we, we can have with the, with, with, with the banking sector. But from the corporate travel point of view, corporate travel is important. There's a lot of people that are traveling now uh, as essential services. There are a lot of minds that are traveling. Uh, or they need to get to various places around the country. We believe that uh, as small as it could be now, uh, it is important that we have some sort of economic activity. Uh, but this can only happen when you open up, uh, you know, uh, the provincial borders, and uh, you you make sure that people that can drive themselves to various places in their own cars, uh, they should be able to do so. And even those that can be able to get into, you know, a regulated public transport to go to a certain places. You know, we believe that they should be able to do so. Open spaces, we believe, should, should also be open for people to be able to access uh, and, and be able to, to get out of their houses and enjoy some time. Of course, all this with protocols, as we have said. We have already presented this, you know, to, 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 to government. But corporate travel, important. Uh, we believe that uh, it is one area where, you know, we can start to see some traction, uh, even if it's interprovincial, even if it's people hiring cars, and driving from Johannesburg to Nelspruit or to Limpopo, wherever they're going to do their work. We believe that is, is a small economic value. But all this from corporates are depressed as well. And uh, consumers are also depressed. And that's why the whole argument of saying, you've got all these international travelers that are sitting in many markets overseas uh, that have received a lot of stimulus packages from their you know, countries. They sit with cash. Uh, our, our currency now is weak. Uh, you know, if we're able to get these guys to travel safely in a, a controlled way, 
and spend this amount of money in our country, uh, we will get you know, some good foreign exchange and we will get some parts of the industry of sector working. And also we'll get some SMMEs working you know, in, in our space. So for us, corporate travel is important, but all travel is important, uh, but it needs to be done in a very controlled way uh, to make sure that you know, we all you know, don't go back and say, you know, we should have done it before. Look at it now, we have the second wave of, of the virus. We are mindful of that. And that is why, you know, we, we're lobbying government hard uh, to make sure that they see us as a sector. As much as we've seen differently in terms of people travel and brought the virus in the country, we're also the sector that's quite critical uh, in making sure that we're part of the solution uh, in terms of, uh, you know, mitigation of, of, of the spread. People cannot live without tourism. Uh, travel is it, 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 in, it, it is in, innate to us. You know, it's something that you know we do all the time, uh, and we cannot uh, uh, live without going out of our houses and do things that we're supposed to do. So it is something sure. that we're saying: let's open up the borders, let's allow people to travel, open spaces with sure. protocols. Sure. Okay. Well, let me just go for one closing comment now from Susan Chorna of. Uh, so SA Tourism, and just to ch toss in a question here as well, someone's saying uh, SA Tourism is in level four, uh, mining isn't, even though SA Tourism is less risk in the mind of the questioner. Just what's your closing comment on this, Caesar? Thank you, I think the key thing here is about confidence, right? The confidence to travel, the confidence to actually consume tourism, whether you are corporate or whether international or even domestic in itself. Because until the consumer or the tourist, the potential tourist, gets the sense that they are able to consume tourism that is safe and there's protocols in place, then we'll start to get the attraction coming through. Secondly, it is not in government's uh, uh, any interest to hold back the sector, but it to essentially enable it so that more jobs can come through and we can get South African tourism back to where it was. And I think the key thing here is that with these protocols that we put in place will help to get the, the confidence back up. But last point here, I think I just want to warn is that we also have to look at the impact of these protocols. As an example, if an airplane is limited to 50% of its capacity, it's still operating at full expenses. So therefore, you might see the cost actually increase. We've seen overseas where restaurants are open, but they're limited to 25, 30% capacity. And you hear that from the owners that say they can actually can't make it, you know, in terms of, um, you know, that type of capacity. So we've got to look at all those dynamics in place. But I fully agree there is a case to smartly open up tourism and we have to be deliberate and be specific. And as David had said, to be data backed as to how we roll this out. Thank you very much. That's uh, Cesar and Chorna of SA Tourism. Uh, just going now, round now for closing comments and wrap up, but also no, one more question before we uh, do go for you, Don. Uh, someone's out there asking, uh, saying that more tourism places should be opened up. But uh, what are they, one question they're asking, they're saying testing people on arrival at a resort, is that really viable? Um, well, that depends on what sort of testing um, technologies are introduced in the next while. I mean, certainly one can do a basic screening. Uh, and, it, and yes, that is viable, you know, uh, temperature testing and, and screening, asking people the relevant questions. But I think the answers you're going to get to that is that, yes, we probably have been in a, in a place that has, uh, you know, uh, where COVID-19 has been, because most of those people will be traveling from an urban area, particularly in, in people who are coming to visit us. Uh, or they will be have, have travelled uh, internationally. So they, the answer to that question would be yes. They, they, they they're going to screen in such a way that that they they have probably been exposed at some time or another. Whether they are actually carrying the virus and whether they are testing positive will depend on what sort of test uh, uh, um, techno testing technology is available. Um, you know, and how quickly one one could do that. I mean, they're talking about doing similar things with the airlines. So if that was introduced to the airlines, I suppose it could be introduced uh, for us as well. Okay, so if I move to Chifiwa uh, Chivengwa for your, your wrap up, I mean, you're putting your evidence together to present to the, the Minister of Tourism uh, so the country can draw up a way out of it. How do you uh, see the future now? I mean, look, uh, you know, we do believe that there is future uh, for tourism, there is a future for tourism. 
And uh, the future of, for tourism is going to be defined by us who work within the tourism space. Uh, this is our industry. We've worked hard to build it up over many, many years. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, the protocols that we have put together and presented to government will go a long way in showing that we can mitigate the spread of the virus. Uh, the suggestions that we've put forth in terms of uh, de-risking the sector, in terms of putting different aspects of the sector uh, at various levels, uh, including level four, to be opened, uh, we believe that, you know, the government will consider those and certain few things will start to open up uh, as early as, you know, when the president announced. That's our hope that, you know, there will be uh, certain things that will be opened up, uh, like open spaces and so forth and so without, on. And people should be able Caesar, to go back So the future uh, is what we're going to define and the future is what we're going to make ourselves, but it's going to be a bumping road ahead. And uh, David uh, Frost, if I could ask you, um, there was a fairly bleak picture painted during this talk saying that there may not be airlines, they may not be uh, holiday resorts anymore. Is it as drastic as that, the future? Well, I think if we, if we sit back and simply accept a scenario that says this is only going to come back sometime next year, that, that is the reality. Um, as I said, I think this, the, 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 everything is moving very quickly. And, and what was true a month ago may not hold in terms of the way forward. So we are we are getting input directly from members it's a it's you know it's 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 a it's incumbent on us to do this but it's not easy just to you know pull in it's a it's a it's a it's a diverse industry there are people out there in rural areas all over the country it's important that we we pull a collective voice that allows a data-driven argument to be made to government about how we could open up safety quicker so that's that's the job that we are all collectively CISA chief, um, myself, and then all the members in, in, in the associations. That's what we are busy busy pulling pulling together at the moment. But I'm confident that we can put a, a well-reasoned argument together. And I think that if one follows um, the sort of discourse around around the response to the virus, um, you know, on, 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 on social media and, and media challenges, is we're moving away, and I think that we needed to 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 go into the lockdown. We needed to really have a, a sober point of departure, and I think the government's been good at that. What we need to do going forward is that the discussion needs to be how can we open up, and all we're saying is let's make that can do, not can't do, because I think there is compelling reasons that this sector a employs a lot of people, puts food on the table for many South Africans. But it's also one of the things that we can win as a country at. We're actually incredibly good. And our offering is an incredibly compelling offering in a COVID environment. Well, um, on that uh, hopeful note there, that optimistic note, I'm afraid uh, that's all we've got time for on this uh, uh, webinar, this web live discussion. Uh, that was, thank you very much to uh, David Frost there. Uh, also, uh, Don Scott, from the Timbavati, and also Chifiwa Chivengwa from the Business Council, and also uh, Mr. Um, Sisa Nchona of SA Tourism. That's, uh, we'll be back again next Tuesday with another subject, and as before we go, we're going to leave you with a little taste of what we're coming up next week. But from me, Chris Bishop, and the team here, it's goodbye. Next week, at the same time, on the same channel, we'll be delving into the world of higher education. How is it going to emerge from the depths of COVID-19? And what does the uncertain future hold for higher education? Be with us here on Business Tomorrow, on air, online and on point on CNBC Africa.